resuming our conversation with Professor Jawad Dar from the University College London. Jawad, um, tell me a little bit about the big things that you've done in materials. You said you had struck out in a different direction. So give me an idea of what you've been doing in that field. Yeah, sure. Uh, it'll be a pleasure. So I first started working in biomaterials uh, and um, well, look, I, I mean, just to give a background, I'm somebody who's really interested in how we can develop materials and use the periodic table. We have so many elements, how we can combine them to create new functional materials. My interest began uh, as a child in about 1987 when, I, when they discovered these low temperature superconductors and I was just fascinated by the potential that these amazing materials could bring. So I always know I wanted to pursue something around material science. And what I did over the years of uh, postdoc and PhD experience, I developed the ability to understand how to assemble materials in an efficient way. So now much of my research is around green chemistry. I use uh, process engineering. So we've developed a continuous hydrothermal. So this is similar to the processes that happen in nature under the ground, a deep, pressure, deep high pressure with water. So this is hydrothermal manufacturing in a continuous way. We manufacture all kinds of functional materials. And the latest thing that I'm moving into is using artificial intelligence linked to data developed from high throughput discovery of these materials. So this is essentially you make lots of materials, you use AI to analyze the data and then to inform you where you should continue to manufacture these materials. You, you, you mentioned 1987, um, that was the discovery of high temperature superconductors. There was a lot of excitement at that time. Was it hype? Because look, uh, we don't see high temperature superconductors even today. What happened to that? You're absolutely right, we don't. But I think there are many discoveries that uh, lead to uh, innovations. You know what was exciting at that time, Pervez, uh, for me, was the fact that they were using robots in Bell Labs to grind and heat materials together, you know, uh, so that it would take the laborious effort that the human being having to grind different oxides of copper and yttrium and barium and different ratios. Now, that you know, that's like what cavemen were doing, grinding metal oxides <laughs> to make pigments and things. So... Actually, if you forget the fact that superconductors were overhyped at the time and, you know, they haven't really changed the world in a massive way, you know, with some small maybe developments. What is important is how we were trying to discover those materials quickly and efficiently and to optimize and scale them up. And actually, that's what actually excited me about superconductors was the idea of discovery. But rather than doing it randomly, how can we do it using intelligent design and automation and really speed up that process? I'll give you one example. The lithium-ion battery uh, was developed in Oxford in the 1980s. We are still optimizing the cathode for the lithium-ion battery. Actually, it was commercialized in 1990 by Sony, when you remember the Sony Walkman. But even today, we are spending millions and millions slightly improving the cathodes for lithium-ion batteries, which were developed more than 40 years ago. This is because we really are not good at making and uh, measuring quickly and efficiently in a way that leads to big jumps in performance. So this is exactly what I think is needed for the next century to, to drive that technological development of. You know, it, it sounds a lot like alchemy to me, um, material science. You mix different things. You're not really capable of, of predicting the properties of the materials that will come out. Are we getting closer towards making material science an actual predictive science? Are we able now to use uh, computers, supercomputers, do quantum mechanical calculations for the conductivity, for the tensile strength, stuff like that? Or are we still far away from it? Uh, physical properties is probably less, uh, I, I don't know much about physical properties, but I can certainly tell you, I didn't mention within that we have people doing various uh, calculations, modeling in silico work. And of course, prior to the work that we are now doing and proposing, um, and we have a big grant being considered at the moment, people were doing a lot of AI with just pure data and modeling. So there's the wealth of that. There's the, the Materials Genome Project from the USA and various other projects have been doing this and predicting properties. So I think we are getting quite good at that now. 
But what is different is actually doing the practice and doing the, the synthesis and the manufacture in a, an efficient way that can keep up with the sort of computational effort. So in my case, we have people doing various types of you know, electronic property, structure property calculations, and that is part of this embedded AI computational materials uh, discovery and automation sort of uh, e uh, umbrella that we are creating at UCL uh, with various other universities. Now, let me understand, your particular work is more engineering oriented. It is more towards uh, industry. You want to create uh, um, things that they can directly use tomorrow. Is, is that what you do mostly? Pervez, I've always been interested in doing science for a reason, not for the sake of just doing science. That's because I'm a chemist and I like building things. So that's always been my motivation. Um, other people have other interests in science. Mine is I want to do it for the practical benefit of mankind. So that's what drives me. And yes, uh, industry is a really big part of uh, what I do. And uh, just, to, you know, one of the things I teach other academics is how to talk to industry, how to engage with them, because they speak different languages to academics and they have different needs and wants. And I think um, part of being a good, ac rounded academic is not just to sell your science, but actually to be able to understand the need in society. I mean, look at, um, you know, we are currently having uh, huge issues with global warming. We know that science can solve a lot of these issues, if not all of them. But of course, you have to convince people that there's a, a bottom line, there's a profit to be made somewhere because people don't like working when they're not making money. And this is the kind of society we live in. You need to understand that, right? Well, yeah, look, I, I... I respect that point of view. It's not mine, though. I find myself much more fascinated by what's inside the nucleus, the quarks and gluons that make it up, and how they interact with each other, and how they can make stars, actual stars up in the sky, just out of plain quarks and gluons and gravity waves and all that sort of stuff. So that's what interests me. But yes, I perfectly understand. And in fact, that's how uh, science makes an impact upon society. So science has got so much, so many different branches in it. They're all, all very interesting, all very worthwhile. But tell me, um, in your experience, you said hard work was one thing. But what about the kind of intellectual capabilities that students need to develop in order to be successful, either in applied science or in theoretical science? I mean, yes, of course, you need to achieve uh, a level of expertise and scholarly um, kind of credibility in any subject. But you know what? Uh, you can learn any subject if you, if you read up enough about it and ask enough questions. I'll give you an example. Uh, when I was 30 years old, I joined a biomedical materials institute. I knew absolutely nothing about biomedical materials, but the first thing I did was go, to, uh, internet wasn't, I mean, it was kind of doing okay, but I still used to go down the library. I went down the library and found 50 of the most relevant papers that I could find on biomaterials and a few reviews, and just read them, you know, multiple times until I kind of understood the basics of biomaterials. And when I got to the institution of when I used to work there in biomaterials, I just asked so many questions, I used to annoy the hell out of most of my colleagues. But you know what, um, if you put enough effort into a subject and you really are interested in it and you're determined to learn about it, uh, there's nothing to stop you. I, I often think we, we often think that, um, you know, we, we often just make up reasons why we can't learn something or it's too difficult. But uh, in my experience, it's okay, I wasn't sort of going to be a world expert overnight. But I would know enough to be able to at least uh, move forward and start a research career in this area. Uh, you know, I think that's the sort of starting point. And then you learn as you go along, of course, right? Well, uh, I, the only thing I slightly disagree with you on is that anyone can do anything. Look, I know that uh, there are lots of things that I'd love to learn. And yet it's too late for me to learn that. I wish I had started much earlier, at 20 years old, but super strings didn't exist then. But um, I wish I had started, well, at age 40, learning the mathematics, which then gets you into this very highbrow kind of physics. But uh, only a few people are able to do that successfully. But everyone can get a bit of an idea. I guess some fields are um, more difficult than others, but that's OK. That's the way it is in, in science. It's got so many different aspects to it. 
So now, now Javad, let, let, let me come to what you've been doing for Pakistan. And we've already talked about your love for Pakistan, uh, which is fine because that is genuine love. You want to help the country. It's not that you're against any other country. In, in, our, uh, in, in our environment here, love for Pakistan unfortunately means you got to hate some other country. That's not what you are about. You want to help the people of this country. You think that this country is its people, not its soil. So tell me a bit about uh, what you've been doing, how you've been helping students, and what your plans are, what this organization that you've set up is. Yes, yeah, so in 2017, we set up, uh, me and a few other uh, academics in uh, British Pakistanis, set up UpSign, so it stands for UK Pakistan Science and Innovation Global Network. We've done various events in the UK. We also last year brought 70 academics from UK South Asia, uh, from all over the place to, to Pakistan, to Islamabad, and we did some partnering workshops to develop ideas around the UN Sustainable Development Goals, around problems in Pakistan, you know, in agriculture, healthcare, and other subjects, energy, water, you know that we, we we have been coming to Pakistan, uh, you know, in various guises as, as uh, visiting profs. What we realized was people were scared of coming to Pakistan previously because of terrorism fears, and you know you have to persuade these people that there's a reason to come. But when they come, they always have an amazing experience mixing with with talented individuals in some of the universities where we interact with. Of course, you've got to choose uh, your collaborators carefully. And uh, there was a very successful event and, you know, we are a bridge that basically our organization is a network. We're a charity. We, uh, we want to, so we work through social media, various groups, uh, topic expertise in agriculture and all these other topics, the UN SDGs. And we try to link Pakistani research with UK research. So there's a networking element. The other element is trying to support young um, British Pakistanis to uh, mentor them and to sort of show them uh, alternative careers other than just being taxi drivers or accountants and doctors. So we're trying to encourage more people in academia and those that are struggling in academia, trying to give them some advice about how to play the game in the UK and try to sort of, you know, maybe move up the uh, university ladder into better universities. And, you know, so I, I, I started that in 2017 because I was a professor at UCL. I know the, the mentality in Pakistan, Pakistanis, is that people tend to respect people in senior positions at top institutions. It's just the way we think. But that's very unfortunate. You should look at what a person is doing rather than his position. Absolutely true. Many of my colleagues in British Pakistanis and in Pakistan, absolutely amazing human beings, amazing scientists. And I wonder why they are in these second-rate universities, and it's not because of their ability, it's purely down to the other factors, which I could tell you, we could talk hours about what the other factors are, but, you know, you're absolutely right, sir. Your efforts now are directed more towards British Pakistanis or towards uh, Pakistanis here in Pakistan. You said you visit every year, is that right? I try to visit once a year. Some years I visited more than once. Some of my colleagues are sometimes visiting six or seven times a year. Uh, one particular colleague of mine, Itisha Rahman, he actually set up an amazing research center in Lahore, in Comsat, and he was visiting up to seven times a year to get it off the ground, to employ people and really set it up. And you know, so many British Pakistanis have really sacrificed their careers in the UK by trying to help Pakistan. So I would say the majority of our efforts to date have been in Pakistan and the cooperation. But now we are moving, because of the pandemic as well, partly, we refocused a little bit more on British Pakistanis. But we would love, when the time is right and where we can get support, we would love to come back and do more in Pakistan, other than what we are already doing online. So we are doing various trainings online, particularly preparing graduates who want to come to do masters and PhD. So we offer them online training, uh, cultural you know, proficiency and things, so that when they come here, they don't have a struggle um, they really do struggle sometimes because they're not prepared properly. Um, and there are some other things that I'm really uh, keen to do, and this is what we call the GAP project. It's good academic practice. Now, I'm sure you will appreciate this, Pervez. 
uh, we have seen how the academic practice are happening in many places in Pakistan. There are always good pockets of good behavior and practice. And we'd like to bring some of those thinkings, which, uh, you know, when you tell people about what is good academic practice, they say, well, this is, um, you know, this is stuff we already know, but then, of course, it's not being implemented, right? So we think that by us coming and delivering this or training trainers, because we want it to be scalable, that hopefully we can transfer some of the ways and behaviors that we have in outside of Pakistan in academia and bring them to Pakistan and just reinforce them, really. I know this is something HEC is planning to do, but, you know, they should use the diaspora. We are here. We are happy to help. And we will give up our time to come and do it. And, you know, I just wish there was more engagement at the top level from rather than just worrying about our remittances and what we can give financially, rather than our intellectual, um, you know, ability to give give back to Pakistan, which is what we'd love to do. I'm so glad you said that, that Pakistanis overseas have more to give than just dollars or pounds to send back home. But I do have a peeve with the British educational system. I have had colleagues at Kaide Azam University, going back to 50 years, they had gone, gotten their PhDs in the UK. They went doing their masters or their MPhils from Pakistan, and they didn't learn very much. While they did their MPhils and their MSCs here, they went to the UK and they came back just as they were. They got employed into some research project and they got a PhD. They came back, they became professors and then they produced students like themselves. There's something wrong with the British higher educational system. They don't test basics. They don't test basics. They don't, they don't force you through the general examinations that you have in the, United, in the United States, where you have to know your basics before they give you a PhD degree. Do you agree or don't you? Uh, well, if we talk about people coming for PhDs, first of all, um, when in the time of Atta Rahman as HEC chairman, that many people came over, it was great that so much money was going into higher education. The problem was that we were sending people to random uh, universities and many of us, including me and most of my colleagues, were horrified. They were coming to second-rate institutions. There was no relationship between the needs of Pakistan and the research they were doing. So when they went back, they were doing, you know, they were coming here and doing nanotechnology or something, which had no relevance to the problems back home. And, you know, people like me and others were just saying, well, this is a complete waste of money. So I'm afraid the experience that Pakistan has had coming to the UK was largely based on the fact that there was no proper consideration. Oh, no, I'm talking well before that. I'm talking of 50 years ago. I'm talking of uh, the 1970s. Uh, Pakistanis who had gone to the UK came back without, mo most of them came back without learning the subject essentials because they had got they had gone from a background which was academically poor when they came back that background had not significantly improved but then anyway that's a different subject what do you recommend now how is it that students should be filtered so that we can get the best people to go to the uk and make best use of the money that pakistan is putting into them? well i think so sorry I misunderstood the question, but uh, um, and, and obviously I was a young child in those days, so I couldn't probably comment. But look, going back to your question, the bottom line is um, there largely many of the deals that HEC has done have been where they can get zero or low fees with different universities around the world. And UK, unfortunately, is not great at that. There are a few universities, so it, it actually they're not matchmaking with um, people who actually would support the students the, the best. I think that, look, uh, as many of my colleagues have suggested, uh, there should really be an identification of what are the problems back home in Pakistan. So what are the problems? And then when you send people, send them to the best agriculture institutes, send them to the best energy institutes here. And, you know, just quality over quantity all day long, okay? Because what you need to produce is a few uh, or, or a lesser leaders who will come back to Pakistan 
and sort of actually start proper programs. They need to be obviously the brightest of the bright, but they need to be really in the applied areas where you, you need to, because, you know, let's face it, large parts of Pakistan have major issues around energy, around agriculture, your pesticide problem in Pakistan, the healthcare problems, um, you know, all of these, many of the solutions are known, and some of them are quite difficult topics, okay, they're not just simple topics, uh, but you know, what we created in the IRC in biomedical materials was a little haven of expertise and built around it uh, with all the disciplines within one center. And I think really these people, when they go back, they need to be sort of setting up, um, if, they, if they're really high quality and they've been to high quality institutions, I'm sure they will flourish if given the support. And you need to support young people who are of high quality. It's really Good. critical. Good. So let's end on this note, quality over quantity. That is what's really, really important. Javad, it's really been a pleasure talking to you. The next time that you come to Islamabad, we shall meet. We have never met. This has been our first engagement and it's been such a pleasure. Thank you very much for the opportunity and I, uh, inshallah, uh, I'll get a chance to come to Pakistan again and carry on the work that UpScience is doing and I look forward to our meeting. Thank you.